Welcome to the 35th episode of Cartoon Avatars. I'm your host, Logan Bartlett. And what you're going to hear on this episode is a conversation I had uh, with Meredith Copet Levian, who's the CEO of the New York Times. We had this at the primary uh, Ventures Summit in New York a few weeks ago. And then you're also going to hear a, uh, a crypto debate between Zach Weinberg and uh, David Hoffman from Bankless that was nothing if not entertaining. Uh, this was also at the primary venture summit. And so I know people, some people have been thirsting for a, uh, another crypto, uh, debate with Zach. And so, uh, we got to give the people what they want. So that's what you're going to hear on the back, uh, back half of this, this episode, but I am, uh, joined right now by Rashad Asir, producer, uh, occasional guest, uh, prisoner of war, as we found out, a seer actually means. So, uh, Rashad, how are, how are we doing today? I'm doing well, and I am doing well. There's been a lot of drama in uh, the drama in my life these days has been between the pickleball. Did you see this on my Instagram story? Between the pickleballers no. and the parents in New York, there's this feud going on. So that's been occupying my my time out of work. But other than can you that, explain uh, what? Can you explain what the drama yeah, is? Yeah, so basically pickleball's like exploded. Fastest growing sport, whatever. LeBron James just invested in yeah, yeah. pickleball is this huge thing. And to uh, play pickleball, do you have to talk about pickleball? Is that one of you the You do have to, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 It, <laughs> it feels like cross CrossFit for like slightly less meathead, but more exactly. pro-y types, I guess. I don't know. It's big in finance too. I don't know. Um, but anyways, they've taken over essentially all the public space in New York and painted chalked courts over them. So the parents are livid because they're taking over the place where their kid, the few areas in New York City where you could actually have your kids ride their bikes and stuff. Uh, and so I was just fucking around the other day and got this guy to like talk about it a little bit. And then the New York Post wrote an article about it. These reporters were reaching out like, hey, will you tell us about this feud? There's like this angry guy with a racket. So who did you have on? Wait, what was the, was it a... No, there was just a random dude out there that got, they got shut down by the like you know, park police or whatever, because they were, you know, playing in what was technically the public area. So I, I was like, just casually talking to this guy on my, you know, selfie cam. You were like man on the street doing interviews, like man on the street. Exactly. And then I guess that, so I blasted that to my story. Someone picked that up, took a bunch of screenshots of it. And then the next day I get forwarded this thing. That's like pickleball player corporation, uh, you know, uh, put a bunch of pictures on his Instagram about uh, what's going on. So anyways, that's the T the in my life. But Where do you stand on the, uh, the, the pickleball versus parents war that's going on? Well, they wanted to interview me and I was like, I, I was like initially very down and then I was like, do I really want to build my brand as like the kid hater, you know, public space stealer? So I decided to just fail. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, I'm riding the fence on this one. I'm on both sides in it for sure. That's perpetually where I live is just uh, <laughs> on on both sides of an issue. Right. Uh, you know, selectively, yeah, yeah. whatever stance you want to take, you just really don't let yourself get pinned down too much on it. But exactly. so Rashad, you were there in uh, in person when we did this New York Times uh interview uh conversation and uh and also the the bankless discussion with zach what uh what are people going to hear here what was your takeaway from it i mean i thought both were great um obviously the, the interview with the new york times ceo was awesome uh i think you did a good job she's you know it's funny she she uh it's kind of like talking to a politician in that she had like her talking points down and she's going to you know i mean if she that's a, that's a job with so much focus and attention on it. And obviously it's a public company as well. And so she was definitely not going to deviate too much from what she wanted to uh, what she wanted to say. Right. Sure. Uh, and so it's uh it's funny if you're I was not totally paying attention uh, at, at like different points in time. And then I would find like we would be going down a path and she, I would be like, wait a second, that wasn't what I asked, yeah. you know? <laughs> she's like, she's like filibustering every day. I was like, that's a great question. And here's some unrelated things that I would prefer to talk about. I mean, you're going to be a, like a trained journalist by the end of this podcast, whenever they, at this point. Um, but yeah, I imagine it was, it was kind of slippery, but I thought you did a good job of keeping her on track and also like orienting the questions. Like our audience is obviously people that build businesses and and work in tech and stuff like that so i thought it was cool to hear 
her perspective on how she's thinking about the New York Times as a business. Yeah, New York Times is a fast. It's a fascinating business for like so many different reasons, right? Uh, and so, and then the Zach thing was uh, was nothing if not entertaining. Oh my god! Like like he is always. That was tough. There was a point. I'm trying to think of my favorite part of that one. He was like uh, the 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 person was uh, David. Sorry, David was saying something about um, you know Amazon and people hate Amazon, and Zach was like, what. What are you talking about? Like, people love Amazon. There's 5,000 packages on everyone's front door right now. It was just a class. It was vintage Zach Weinberg, but yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. good discussion. And they both held their own in the, the whole debate. So it was great. Yeah, we'll let, we'll let people debate uh, or hear that for themselves before. But uh, yeah, no, it, yeah. certainly interesting. Well, I, I'm kind of struggling through right now. I uh, So my voice has been, I think it's back around, but my voice is a little bit uh, shot and I can't decide. I, I, I was down uh, this weekend, so I've been on the road for the last like two and a half weeks. And um, this past weekend, I went to Tennessee, Florida, which has been a college football game I've been looking forward to for, I think I've been planning it, planning it with a bunch of buddies for like six months. And so we uh, we were down there and uh, I don't know. I mean, you went to a school with college football, but uh, you don't strike me as a college football guy. <laughs> um, it's not in my DNA, but I would definitely go to the tailgates and do all the other stuff. But I mean, it's been fun watching watching along. I, I definitely get it. It's cool to have a thing that you can follow along with and you watch tune in every week and stuff like that. How, how was it being down there? We had a cross pod collab uh, going. So I was down there uh, with like half the people listening are probably going to know exactly who I'm talking about and half are going to be like, I have no idea. But I was down there with a uh, a Barstool Sports podcast called uh, Macro Dosing as well with uh, PFT Commenter. And so we got PFT Commenter and Arian Foster. Uh, we were hanging with them for a couple of the days, which was uh, which was super fun. And we got uh, PFT outfitted in all Tennessee gear, and uh, he was kicking field goals on the sidelines, which was uh, which was fun. Pretty pretty funny uh, funny guys. I'm not sure exactly what our overlap is with the uh, the macro dosing podcast and uh, and this, but um, yeah, it was definitely definitely fun. And the outcome of the game was uh, was exciting as well. So uh, it, well worth my uh, my voice being absolutely uh, <laughs> shot and really struggling through these last couple days but uh yeah it was a fun weekend do you hit the like is there specific bars in knox i think i've partied in knoxville once we went down there for some like sports tournament or something when i was in college but like what's the scene uh, a handful of dive bars yeah it's a cool it's like a two hundred thousand person like uh city with uh you know it's on the water it's got a big college there and so yeah i mean there's you know it, it's it's like a nice sort of uh southern city in the mountains right and so there's there's bars and nice restaurants and and all that but uh yeah a bunch of my buddies hadn't been to a college football game or at least not in a long time and so uh we had a pretty pretty good setup it was uh it was 48 hours of uh of nonstop enjoyment and so i i'm paying the price uh i feel yeah. like being being in your mid thirties is like thinking you can still uh, operate in your twenties, but uh, but actually, then your body. <laughs> like I always joke that I can still throw high nineties. Like if you need need me to come out of the bullpen, I can give you my fastball, right. but I uh, I can't I can't do it regularly. Like I can't your shoulder's gonna be sore the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be yeah. I, so that's I've been paying for it all week. Uh, I I know you were up late because we got a late night slack in the whatever one of our group chats and in. in in Slack about uh, a message that I guess Mark Andreessen was sending about funding Elon or I don't know, I guess this leaked on your Twitter feed. Yeah. Uh, so for, for context, I guess in the Twitter discovery process, uh, a signal message between Elon and Mark Andreessen was, uh, was disclosed. It was actually an email uh, that had the screenshot of Mark and uh, Elon going back and forth. And, and I, I remember it was like, it was like one thirty in the morning. Uh, I was in Knoxville and I saw it someone, I think someone posted it to Twitter. And so, yeah, I sent it internally to Slack and then totally forgot about it. And then, <laughs> uh, and then yesterday it like broke as a news story or something. And, uh, and I don't know what the delay between the two 
two ones, but uh, funny enough, I actually deserve David George is runs Andreessen Horowitz's growth fund. And he's uh, he CC'd on the uh, the email that's now in discovery. And uh, David actually introduced me to Elliot. Um, they were business school classmates, my partner here, Elliot. So I actually uh, deserve my job at Redpoint to some extent in, in part because of David's intro. So uh, I uh, I won't I won't comment on uh, on that signal message beyond uh, beyond that, other than to say it was uh, it was amusing. And now all this stuff that's coming out in discovery from the Elon Musk uh, case, I feel like there's just going to be a litany of uh, of funny things that are going to uh, going to be disclosed about how all of this came to be. That's pretty funny. What else happened in news this week? I guess there was the the Kathy Wood arc launching an investment fund. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I, so I guess, if, I mean, people that don't know, so Kathy Wood uh, has been, she was kind of like the retail uh, uh, meme stock queen over the course of the pandemic, right? And she started this this fund arc uh, that was, uh, uh, I think, named after the Ark of the Covenant or something. It has like a bunch of biblical references and things. But she she has a bunch of pillars that uh, clean tech and uh, and autonomous driving and AI and a bunch of these pillars that were very um, indexed to uh, things that did well over the course of the pandemic. And she sort of became like this cult like figure uh, and. They've had Arc has had a pretty significant sell off here in the last uh, as things have reverted uh, back to the mean a little bit. Arc has had a pretty significant sell off um, in the last uh, the last couple months. But I guess uh, what, what what came out this week was they were actually um, and I've I've met a few of the people on their team and they were they were sort of talking about this a few months back uh, with with me actually about them launching a, a venture fund uh, and so it's interesting I guess a few interesting points here uh, so they're doing it you can invest like access to venture and the types of people we we raise money from are like you know, people that can write 15, 20 million dollar checks at a minimum. Right. And we want these big endowments and institutions and uh, pension plans and all that stuff, just because right. it's huge pools of capital and they're very long term oriented in their approach. Um, I think what's interesting, ARC is democratizing this and they're doing it with uh, Titan is the. Uh, is like the service that they're partnering with. And I think they're taking minimum commitments of like a uh, hundred dollars for people. Oh, and wow. that's going to give them access to venture. They're also, um, they're doing the fee structure is a little different. I think I saw it was uh 2.75%. They're taking as like a management fee annually, uh, which most venture firms and private equity firms take 2%, uh, but they're also not taking any carry uh, is I think what I read. And so um, if, if they generate, if they turn, you know, $10 into $30, normally the way that works is uh, the, the manager will take uh, 20 or 25, or in some cases, 30% of that for themselves. And so the difference between the, the 30 and the uh, ten, that twenty dollars, uh, either you know whatever, four or five dollars of that would go to the the manager. I don't think they're. Uh, I think when I read it, they're they're not actually going to be doing that. Um, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I I like people innovating in venture in general, right? And I think that's it's it's cool that they're democratizing access to this asset class that. Uh, that has been hard to get access to. Um, I I do wonder a bit, uh, I mean, the types of people that are gonna be investing, like are they, should they be investing in these very illiquid assets uh, that are very volatile? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think right. that that's, that's been, normally there's like a threshold of uh, accredited investor or whatever, uh, where you need to have like, I think it's a million dollars in liquid assets or something to be able to do this because it is so volatile and speculative. Um, the The progressive would say that that's unfairly punitive because it's allowing the rich to get richer uh, yeah. and uh, not giving access to the common person. Um, 
others would probably argue that like the sophistication of someone uh, that has that amount of money also has uh, a larger amount of money to lose. And so uh, I think that's that's the debate on both sides. But it, it's definitely interesting. I think one of the things that remains to be seen is like venture is a very good asset class if you're in the top tier assets, right? And so if you're if you're in Sequoia, right, um, the there's a network effect associated with that where Sequoia uh, uh, has has done great deals, and so they're involved in you know a bunch of iconic companies, and so therefore uh, the next generation of iconic companies want to work with them, and therefore they get unfair access and unfair pricing, and that leads to great returns, which leads to you know whatever that flywheel continuing to spin around. Um, venture also is a very shitty asset class. If you start getting into the tier twos and tier threes, like the distribution of it is like a stair step where there's big drops, right? Versus yeah. most asset classes is very linear, uh, where, Hey, to be the 76th percentile is effectively the same as the 75th in venture. There's these very outsized returns. And so if you're not in you know, some portion of the winners, then you're not going to generate great returns. And so I guess one question is just like, is there going to be adverse selection in this? Right. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I've heard the reason also, another reason that venture firms haven't done this historically is like, uh, from, uh, understanding who's actually making the investments is, and like the KYC of this all, like, is that a, an issue or is that there, there are enough solutions to, to figure that out? Like if they're raising $5,000 from individual people, how do you make sure you're avoiding? I mean, the administrative complexity associated with investing in private funds is high. And so the KYC, I don't think is as much of an issue. I assume Titan's handling a lot of that, the, the, the service that they have, but there is a lot of like paperwork associated with each incremental, uh, person that you take on. And so I haven't read the fine print on like how they're, how they're dealing with all of that. Uh, it is different than just investing in a mutual fund and the mutual funds or whatever have that much more automated. Uh, and so I, I assume they've, they've figured out how to, uh, how to make all this work in a super scalable, um, way it, in general, I think like the venture asset class needs, people to keep innovating, right? And like most of these things are probably going to fail. And that's not to speak specifically of ARC or whatever. Like there's a reason it's really hard to break into the top tier of venture. But when you do it, it's also really hard to fall off, right? It's really hard to uh, to to mess that up when you get it to a good place. And so I think that this industry, you know, people, people poking and prodding and finding new ways of, of differentiating is a, is, is a net good thing, even if any individual one's going to fail. Cool to see how it plays out. All right. Are we ready for a little fight to help uh, close out our day here? Uh, <laughs> we'll see if these guys can deliver, but, um, First off, David Hoffman, the co-founder of Bankless, which is the unquestioned leader in the kind of crypto uh, media world with podcast, newsletter, et cetera, um, is going to be squaring off-ish with Zach Weinberg, who most of you know as one of the great provocateurs of the Twitterverse, uh, already was, and then when crypto showed up, he kind of he kind of doubled down on his bets. Uh, and we welcome Sahil Bloom as moderator. So come on up here, guys. Sahil, I don't know if you need to sit in the middle on this one, or, <laughs> um, but we'll let you take it away. No water for you. Nice. All right. Oh, my God. I actually had to keep these guys apart in the, uh, in the <laughs> green room. So I should be sitting in between them. You're absolutely right. Um, maybe just to like take a quick pulse on the audience. How many people out there are either investing in or building in Web3? Just like quick show of hands. So we've got quite a few. So maybe call it 50-ish percent of the group. Um, just to start out, can we take like 30 seconds or a minute from each one of you guys? David, let's start with you on 
your overall perspective on Web3? Like, what is your kind of uh, map of reality around what we're seeing today? Yeah, uh, and the way that I think people understand crypto, there, there's like, crypto tends to polarize people on their opinions, and it's just based on their personal disposition. You have people like me and my co-host Ryan who zoom 5, 10, 20 years into the future and talk about the merits that crypto will bring in the future based off of the principles, first principles that we see being built today. So we really extrapolate into the future using historical patterns that we've seen, the rise of the internet, the rise of self-sovereign money. And these people are like the people that have taken the crypto pill or are the, like the crypto natives. And they understand, they, they believe deeply, they understand where this trajectory of this crypto world is going and they can see that future. And then you have like the crypto skeptics who kind of see where crypto is now with like $50 billion being deleted by Terra Luna and like rug pulls and the people that can't define Web3 because this is what happens every single bull market. People come in that don't really understand the industry. Uh, they focus on short-term products because the mania of the bull market has taken over. And then it really confuses the outside world as to what the hell we're really doing here in this crypto industry because it gets so noisy every four years we have this bull market. And so people find themselves like on one side of these camps. Like, can you get past the, the short-term noise and see crypto for on first principles for what it will do to the future? Uh, or do you see the short-term skeptics? Uh, and then like the other two camps I'll put people into is that like there are uh, people who are like, how can the blockchain improve real estate? Or can we put a supply chain on a blockchain and like putting some like FinTech layer on crypto? Uh, and then there's like the crypto natives who see like these things that purely exist just in the digital world. They don't have any external dependencies. And these are, the, again, the people that extrapolate out towards the future. I took way more than 30 seconds, so Zach, I'm sorry about I that. I was about to cut you yeah. off, so I'm yeah. glad. Um, Zach. It's like, David, shut up. <laughs> uh, anywho. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like a lot of revisionist history, I think, in general. People are like, well, in every tech cycle, these things happen. And then you're kind of like, that's nah, just like not true. It didn't happen. That, like, nobody lost $50 billion in... Uh, scams in, in the early 2000s and then in the next wave with, with mobile. Like this idea that we're losing all this money all the time in a bull cycle is just like not accurate. It's not what happened. Um, so I was trying to come up with like my take on crypto. I, I think I have like a pithy way of thinking about this now, which is if you, everyone talks about crypto as technology, right? It's like, it's like interesting technology innovation. I've, I've worked in software since I was like 19. And every single time you have like interesting technology, whether it was, and we'll go through some examples, but you can go through like NoSQL databases, or you could go through like GPUs or any sort of like actual interesting technical innovation. Usually what you hear from people is, and developers, I want to use this technology because it is faster, cheaper, I could put more data in it or whatever. There's like a very clear factor of like why that technology is going to win because it improves the downstream user experience. And then in crypto, like nobody picks crypto for the technology, right? Nobody's like, hey, I want a slower, harder to access, like decentralized, de like it, you're not picking it because the technology is better. And actually, if you take it a step further, like all of these level one or layer one and layer two companies, it's interesting tech in the sense that they're basically putting like massive amounts of money to try and catch up to a database. Right? Like that's the goal now is like, how can we make this thing work as performant as like a database, uh, which we've had for 30 years. So the question is like, what is the, what is the tech, right? Like wh where is the tech in all of this? Because it's not faster and it's not cheaper. And I think the answer has kind of been staring at us in the face the whole time, which is the tech is the ability to speculate on the coin. That's the reason why people are so interested in it because it enables this kind of like inherent trading ability. And I don't really view that as like technical progress per se. I don't think that's a better piece of technology. I think it's kind of like a feature of uh, speculation that we've been able to add in an unregulated environment to, to a lot of pieces of software. That's why I view this idea of like Web3, because it's not accurate because it's not, it's not a next iteration of technology. It's not faster, it's not cheaper. So it's those characteristics. But let's go down the rabbit hole here a little bit. You know, and I think I've listened to a bunch of your critiques and the different debates you've done, which are all wildly entertaining, by the way. So I hope we, I hope we get to that level. Um, but there's this concept of Hitchens razor, which basically says that what can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. I'm sure you're familiar with it. And I think a lot of the critique of Web3 is to say that the proponents have yet to present the 
evidence to suggest that it is an advancement from a technological perspective. So David, let's start with you and we'll kind of start zoomed out and then we'll zoom in on different specific use cases. But just at the sort of rails level, like talk about Ethereum, talk about Solana, some of the kind of, um, you know, the layer ones, if you will, that we can, you know, think of as being better than what is out there today. What about them from a first principles perspective is uniquely better than existing technology? Yeah, and it's important to note that if you're comparing a blockchain, blockchain to a database, it's the wrong frame of mind. And this is what like the technologists always get wrong about crypto. It's, it is a revolution in finance, but beneath that is a revolution in money. And money is something that's like as large as the nation state itself, like fiat money is issued by nation states. We call these things smart contracts, not because they are better databases, but they're because they're better legal systems. They're better court systems. They're a court system for the digital internet world. And so yes, a blockchain as a database is way slower than a centralized database. That's the point. It's because the slowness of this database supersedes national court systems. And so it's slower and more expensive than a database. It is so much faster than a court system where you have to pay lawyers. And if you wanna go and speed run through the history of money and finance, every unlock in finance you actually find a way to enable technology to automate the lawyers. And when markets break down, like in 2008, things collapse back down to the lawyer level of markets. Markets, ultimately, when things broke down in 2008, you had lawyers that were like, you know, passing assets back and forth in the most inefficient and expensive and slow way possible, the legal system. Now, if you have smart contracts that manage our financial system, as we saw what happened with this like uh, crash in early 2020, crypto goes down, a lot of the stuff gets pulled out of the market. It was the centralized uh, companies that had black box assets that didn't let you know what they were doing all collapsed and created contagion as if it were 2008. Meanwhile, all the DeFi applications, Uniswap, Aave, Compound, Maker, completely uh, had completely fair and orderly market clearing where all the centralized actors broke. So yes, if you compare it to a database, it's just, it's a terrible database, but it's not, should not be a database. It should be a system for passing assets that don't need courts and lawyers to do this. And it's way faster than that. So we've got, okay, this is not a database, not better, so that market's gone. We've, we've now shifted it to, it's actually a technology, I just wanna like repeat what I heard. It's now a technology for like digital dollars. Okay, fine. Uh, and digital dollars where you can write all of the rules you could possibly ever need into code. Mm -hmm. Hence smart contract, right? This is this idea. Smart is always like such a fascinating term to me because what they really mean is like every piece of logic sits in the code, which means you have to be able to like put the logic in the code without any sort of misunderstanding. So we've now shrunk the opportunity set to like digital dollars where we can write the rule into code perfectly all the time, right? So, and I always used to give this example to people of like, contracts are complicated. There's a reason why you have like lawyers and courts is because it's really difficult to predefine everything in a contract because you don't know how the world is gonna pan out. And the simplest example I always like to give people is like, what if I say to you, you have to go and paint my house blue? And you go, great, how much? And I say 5,000 bucks, cool, done. That's a contract, right? And it seems simple at the outset. But now you've got like, well, what if I painted it the wrong shade of blue? Or I painted it, I missed a spot. Or, you know, I didn't paint it on time. And what you realize is like, actually contracts are kind of more guiding the outcome than anything else. And there's a reason we have like systems in place. It's because you can't predefine everything. And so what you end up with is like, all right, I gotta write all the possible edge case scenarios into the contract. And I agree with you, like, yes, for that little niche box that you just described, which is basically like gambling on the internet, like crypto is fucking awesome. Uh, that's just like a really tiny market of like digital gambling. The, the whole other thing, everyone always uses, it's not to pick on you, but like everyone always talks about like, oh, the, the immediate settlement. Let's just talk about why like that's a bad thing. Uh, in the reason like some of these, these decentralized services don't have like liquidation issues is because it's fully collateralized, meaning like all of your money is there. They, there's no other, you can't borrow, you can't lend. The whole point of the financial system, the whole point of banking is to be able to issue credit, right? It's to create money out of money. Otherwise, like you're fixed in the number of dollars. It's the same reason why when I go to a bank, I put in a deposit and the bank can lend it out multiple times. And so the banking system like enables credit, 
in a way where like fully collateralized lending obviously doesn't. If you collateralize everything, it's like you got to have absolutely everything there. If you were to have like an immediate unwind in an illiquid, like an illiquidity situation, if you go back to 2008, when the US banking system kind of froze up and you said, hey, I'm going to take the real time dollar amount value of all the underlying assets and I'm going to use that to decide whether someone is a liquid. Every single bank in the United States is insolvent immediately. And in the crypto world, then we're just like, all right, cool, the banks are done. We take this down. It's actually a feature to be able to unwind things in a proper, slow manner because in a liquidity crisis, which is every banking crisis in the history of time is a liquidity crisis at its core, meaning like we're not sure who owns what, we don't know exactly how much it's worth, is because you have these asset classes where the underlying value of the asset, in this case in 2008, it was real estate assets, you're just like, oh shit, I don't know what, I need time to go and figure this out. And the idea that like in a crypto world, we're just gonna immediately liquidate everything I, I never understand why people pitch that as a feature. Like to me, that is a disastrous scenario where those black swan events basically bankrupt anybody who's taken out any sort of credit. The whole point of the banking system is to enable safe credit. And here we are saying, actually, that's like not exactly what we want. We want the opposite. We want fully collateralized. And if in a minute your credit, you know, the underlying assets for your credit are, are, are in trouble, we're just going to take your money. That's, it, that's the crypto system. Do you want to comment on that, David? Yeah, sure. There's a number of different ways to take that in. It's really about layering a financial system. And so you can do all the things that, you know, what we call in the crypto world, TradFi, traditional finance. You can do all TradFi things on top of crypto, but it's important to have some things based on the foundation. Irreversible payments need to be at the foundation. And you can build irreversible payment, or reversible payments on top of irreversible payments. Can't do it the other way around. Same thing with like a, a credit-based financial what system. That, what does that mean? You can't build irreversible payments in the existing financial system? Of course you can. No, you, you can, you, so crypto is a paradigm of irreversible payments on a blockchain. Correct. And you can build systems on top of that if we desire reversible payments to revert them. Okay. But it's about, the, it's about the ordering of operations here. Well, why is that Same better? thing with like a bank where you have a collateral-based system but you can create a credit-based system on top of a collateral-based system, but if you put the credit system uh, under the collateralized system, it doesn't work because you've, you've, it's the cart before the horse. Well, I, I have no idea. And so the whole idea is that you can create any sort of permutation of, of the things that we are already aware of in normal so, uh, uh, finance, so long as we actually create the base principles correctly, which is a solid financial system that is operated by smart contracts, that have this security that if you deposit your assets, you will 100% get your assets back no matter what. And there, that is a, something that the legal system cannot offer. And so we need to build a financial system using crypto rails, using crypto-based principles that uses the strength of crypto. And we can still have all these magical tools that we already have, so long as we have strong settlement assurances under these layers. So you're telling me there's massive demand out there for irreversible payments. I think there is a massive market out there for strong settlement assurances that guarantee that your asset is yours. Strong property rights are the foundation that created America. Do you, do you see people like some random person shows up and is like, oh, your house is mine now, or like your bank account? Like this, this show, and so happen. you don't put that on that layer. That's the wrong layer for that. What about, yeah, the, my point and is, houses are never going to be on the blockchain because the houses are always a meat space piece of technology. Wh when was the last time anybody in this room had their checking account money stolen. Well, you're in America. It doesn't happen. That's you're in America. You're so like, it's a, it's a narrow-ish viewpoint. You're telling me across the, across the world there is consistent theft of people's money in their checking? Like, what the fuck are we talking about? This it's not, no one, this I, doesn't happen. Like, as somebody who's operated in crypto since 2017, I've never been rug pulled. No one's stolen any of my, my, my funds. And that's because I have the assurances that no one can actually do. Yeah, it. I mean, it seems like No, but I, general, get, I get it. I get the checking point. Checking accounts are like a pull-based system. They can pull money out of your account. I get the point that in theory, in crypto, if you're willing to hold your own private keys and you don't rely on a central authority and like all these things that normal people will never do. But let's just assume for a second, everyone wants to like carry their, their keys in their pocket. Again, it makes no sense. Yes, like sure, you can not steal the money because you own it. Now, hopefully, you're not mugged or you like lose your pants or whatever. Uh, but like, what problem are we solving? This is not like the traditional finance system doesn't have issues with people stealing your money. It doesn't have issues with like reversible. It works. So, which piece of this? I get that we're like slowly rebuilding all of the features of the financial system that already exist. I get that that's like the goal. Why is that better? What piece of this is actually better besides the ability to send money to somebody 
immediately without being able to get it back. I mean, I can run through the list of use cases that, that has been used in recent years. Like, let's talk about the invasion of Russia into Ukraine and how Ukraine's fled from, uh, Ukrainians fled from Ukraine without any sort of being able to access their banks. And they were able to do that because they stored money inside of their brain. Yes, I will grant, the, I always like to give, this is my favorite one to give because you're right. When war breaks out in yes. your country and you need to flee, when shit breaks down, <laughs> you want a strong foundation what? that everything can collapse back down. No, I you have just described like, you know, a market of like one country every year. Like, okay, great, sure, you can leave the country temporarily with your crypto, which by the way, to use it, you have to convert it back to fiat anyway. So like, okay, it's just like a, it's like diamonds. Like That's diamonds. one. We can also what talk about the, uh, the Afghan women who was writing uh, for a blog and they were, she was being uh, paid in Bitcoins because she wasn't allowed to spin up a bank account and she was being able to pay directly to leave her abusive husband and take her kids out of Afghanistan. Yes, I agree. There are a bunch of shithole so, countries out there. Yes, there, like, are, like, there are use cases that need to allow for the individual to have the most amount of control because if we come into a world of authoritarian governments or somebody trying to steal your shit, being able to control your money inside of your brain is a superpower. Okay, so the market for crypto, I, I'm not disagreeing per se. I, like I agree, getting your money out of the country, cool, that's better than like carrying diamonds. If you can remember your, your, crypto, your key, because you don't want to carry the key on you because they'll take it. Uh, and then like getting paid in a non-local fiat currency in a few countries across the globe where we have completely unstable governments, Afghanistan is a great example, I'm sure there are like 10 others. All right, cool, like what, the market size we just described is like a billion dollars. Well, what about all the things that brands are doing today? So like talk about, I don't know, NFTs, sure. gated access, things like that, that people are using it for. Sure. Anything there? Yeah, so like we're getting into this like part of the, of the web two phase where no one likes the centralization of Amazon, Google, Facebook. Everybody likes that. Do you know how much money those companies make? If people didn't like it, they wouldn't fucking shop on those sites. Everybody, I, I'm probably on Amazon nine times a day. I, if you is, go, I bet you if you go home, the people in this audience, there's gonna be like 8,000 Amazon packages sitting on their porch. People fucking love Amazon. They love Google. They love yeah. Facebook. They may not say they love Facebook, but they fucking use it all the time. And so this idea right, that like, David. people don't like this, <laughs> these companies is just wrong. They, they love these companies. They're some of the most loved companies out there. Facebook is the most loved company out there? By usage, maybe not by yes, like... By usage, because there are no alternatives. So yes, this is the paradigm that we live in. We have to use these things because there's no ability to exit from these systems. Facebook you doesn't can download you, your Facebook data. You cannot download your social graph on Facebook. Ah, uh, yes, all those friends I like friended in yes. college who I if don't you want see. To make a, like, I really gotta download those people and make if sure I can you wanna make a farce that. out of just like the current like data concerns, things that David Chom predicted in the 80s that all of our data would ultimately become commoditized and commercialized. You know that's all your eyes, sorry, not to cut you off. It's just like, but I'm, I'm doing it anyway. Uh, that's normally what people say when they're gonna cut someone off. Yeah, like, sorry, I'm about to do this really <laughs> bad thing. Uh, it's like doomsday prepping. Yes, it is like doomsday prepping because you need the bottom foundation to build on that so that if you have better, if we are in Goldilocks times where everything is happy, we can start to build more layers of trust on top of it. But it's about creating the best foundation to enable layers of trust on top. I just love that like we went from web one to web two and then web three is like, because society might collapse, we're going to go all the way back the option, to bear bonds with or whatever. We hope that we don't, but we have the option if it does. And that is actually how you create human flourishing on top of that. Like the, the Bitcoiners of the world are like super pessimistic about the future. They are the doomsdayers, like uh, gold bugs, preppers of crypto. Like they're the ones who are, who are like all blockchains are like too ridiculous, only do Bitcoin. The Ethereans are actually like the optimistic ones that say like, oh, we can actually do things on our financial platforms that are a little bit more like about creating wealth rather than uh, you know, equal some pies, for example. And so, but it's about, you need to have this escape hatch at all times because that's how things always uh, provide levels of safety. And what is, crypto, what is aligned with the crypto values and the, the American values that this uh, country is birthed upon is that the individuals are the most self-sovereign unit on this planet. And if you give them the power, they will self-organize around these principles of censorship resistance, freedom, autonomy, and the ability to do whatever they want. But it's like, is anybody here worried about all their money being stolen tomorrow by like the US, like, 
enough to like go hold like a significant percentage of their wealth in some like illiquid, difficult to access asset. Like, like, cause if it's truly, if it's truly doomsday prepping and I'm, I'm cool with that use case, like sure. Uh, then you better hold your own private keys too. It's not about them revoking dollars out of your account. It's about the fact that there is war going on in Europe right now. The European dollar is being debased because people are about to freeze going into winter. And so the, it's the backdoor theft of rampant inflation by monetary policies that we can't control. That, no, yeah, you can have your dollars. It's just that your dollars Wait, are but now, all right, So now we're saying it's actually not just digital dollars. It's no, no, inflation it's, it's not now we're saying this. It's and we're saying this. So it's, it's it, all it, of the use cases. And so the European what's dollar the thing is being to me about away. the inflation hedge argument is inflation is doing this and Bitcoin is doing that. Since so I don't like, I, I'm price, not like a Bitcoin financial wizard, but zero, like bro. hedge usually means like as this one does that, you kind of like catch the wave with it. And it seems to me like it's just correlated with risk assets. This is not Bitcoin, a hedge. Bitcoin started at zero. Ether started at 25 cents. Like all crypto assets started at zero. So like it's really timely during the bear market for you like, ah, ha, crypto's going down. How ah. are you thinking but about the, the bear market? The whole point of an inflation hedge is to hedge inflation. I don't, and think Bitcoin, I don't think Bitcoin's an inflation hedge. And the whole point is that these are things that are decorrelated from the actual fiat money system. But you just described- So we've talked about social platforms. We've talked about settlement assurances. We've talked about the value of these currencies. And yes, you reject all of them. But the fact that we're talking about every single one gives an indication of how broad the scope of this crypto revolution actually is. It I, does everything. What do you want it to do? Finance, social media, gaming and NFTs? Like pick your category because crypto's got something for every single asset class here. It kind of does all of those really poorly. I know. Yeah, that's and that's because though. you're one of the guys that I talked about in the beginning that sees crypto for what it is now, but can't imagine it in the future. I mean, I, look, I, I, it, I think part of why this thing is so interesting to me is because like I spent my entire career building startups and investing in startups. And like, I've like intimately worked on, I mean, down to like designing the stupid pixels. And like, usually in a software startup, you can be like, okay, this happens and this happens, you like logically reason your way through it. And that's by the way you bet you have to make. And that's why like primary is here, you know, to invest in your ideas that they can like see through. Uh, and here, like the logical reasoning just doesn't work. Like you end up back, you end up back in these crazy edge cases, which is like, we're gonna- No, we're gonna you pushed edge. me there. <laughs> well, but you, these, this is, you articulated like hedging the debasement of the euro, which obviously isn't working. Like stealing, like escaping from a country, fine, cool. Like I'll give you the one time use case of like running away from the country. It makes a ton of sense. That would be great. But like, that's not a market. That's like a, that's a project. Uh, we've talked about like s immediate settlement of fully collateralized finance, which in the history of finance is going the other direction, right? Finance is about issuing yeah, credit. More capital efficiency, yes. It's not capital efficient to not have credit. Yes, I 100% agree with right? that. So like, this is my whole point of like, how do you get to a system that's better? I still, I'm like, it does a few things bad, like poorly today, including the database stuff, it does poorly. Uh, Zach, let me just ask, you know, in this room, you probably have VC, a handful of VCs representing probably billions of dollars that are going to be deployed into Web3 or marked to be deployed into the Web3 space over the coming years. Are they just missing something that you know that they don't? Are they dumb? Like, what is, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I don't think they're dumb. I think they are... Uh, well, what you're saying I is mean, that actually, it's... Actually, I do think a lot of them are dumb. To be clear, I do think yeah. a lot of them are dumb. Uh, <laughs> like, look, you know, in every hype cycle, people make a lot of money before the music stops. There are a lot of people who got very, very rich on mortgage-backed securities, a lot. There's a lot of wealth created from like multiple boom cycles because when you're running up to the top, everything looks great. And so in a way, like I don't necessarily disagree with investing in crypto in a boom as long as you know why you're doing it. If you understand, you're like, look, I'm gonna ride this gravy train to the top and I'm gonna try and sell as fast as I possibly can because like retail is gonna prop it up and that's how I'm gonna make a bunch of money. I think the answer is like, yeah, you, you, you probably will actually make a bunch of money uh, as you're seeing, right? Like the Andreessen first crypto fund because of Solana is like a 20X fund, right? Because of this one, one coin. So I don't, I guess as, a, as an investor, sometimes you actually can get paid for being wrong. Right you, now, you're right right now, and then you're wrong in the long run. But that's like reasonably profitable in a lot of different systems. Some of some people are going to get caught with their pants down. 
is it next year? Is it the year after? Is it, I, I, don't, I don't know, but you know, like early in the hype cycle is pretty good. It's like a nice place to be. So is your view that we are past, we're long, long in the tooth in the hype cycle and this bear market that we've sort of entered is the beginning of the end? I, I think rising rates force all businesses, crypto just being one type of company, to prove that it can eventually generate free cash flow. Because all of us, look, the, 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 th the three year treasury, right, is paying like three and a half. When inflation like kind of inches its way down, if the treasury is still paying three and a half, now you've got like big dollars going like, all right, I can do this like super speculative thing over here, which may actually go to zero, or like the US federal government is gonna pay me three and a half, three and a half on my money for three years. It's a pretty good deal, mm -hmm. right? And that three and a half might be four, and it might be four and a half. And so that's why you see, I think people kind of looking a little bit more going like, where is this going to net out? With crypto, you have this one unique little escape hatch. And I think until it's, it's closed, crypto is still like an interesting thing to invest in because you have the escape hatch, which is you can sell the coin, right? Like in almost any other asset class, if you're doing private investing, you're locked. My shares in Plaid, I, I, I've had them since 2011. I'm not going to be able to sell them for like another five years. It looks great, but like I can't get any money out. And so at the end of the day, like that company has to make money. For me to make money, that company has to make money. In crypto, you can kind of be like, yeah, I'm gonna sell right now because I can sell the coin. And so I think that like liquidity escape hatch actually creates a longer duration bubble. Because actually kind of putting your money in as long as you can get out quickly is, is maybe not a bad idea financially. I don't think they're right in the long run, uh, but timing this thing, I mean, look, I'm obviously bearish, but I'm not gonna bet against Crypto, it's insane. Like, well, how could you bet against this thing? Like every once in a while something pops, you know, a thousand X. To your point about Ethereum, like I think betting against it is, is, is crazy as well. But uh, yeah, look, I think rising rates are gonna cause people to look at the underlying assets of all startups and kind of go, how do I get cash out of this thing? Because that is, if that's, that's investing one on one. You put in money, you hope to get more back later, and ideally it's from the cash flow of the business. David, and I final totally thoughts? agree with just really quickly that like there is, it's too easy to get liquidity on crypto. It's like one of the best features is that you can have day one liquidity, and it's also one of the worst features that you can have day one liquidity. And that's because it doesn't lock in founders and teams to be committed to their project. But I will also blame this on the SEC because these systems that exist on the internet need to be decentralized. So founders are actually pressured to decentralize their token to give control over to the community, and then all of a sudden they lose the incentive to build the thing. I'm gonna blame that one on the SEC because this is basic securities laws that we need a regulatory sandbox for crypto. You think like when the SEC regulates it, what then what? I think that found there needs to be some sort of model that allows for these projects to achieve their goals of central decentralization by distributing tokens while also ensuring that founders and early team members have to keep on working for the long term and stay aligned with the token price, as you were saying. In what so like SEC, I just don't know how that happens. Like SEC implements a five-year lock on all employees. I think we can start by kicking Gary Gensler out of office. And then we'll I don't, yeah. I don't really have, I don't have like an opinion on Gary or anything, but like, I just don't know what the solution is besides it's a regulated security, which means it's centralized at that, a certain point. Right, right? A regulatory, it has, Hester Persa, the SEC, has some great regulatory sandbox models for this. I just think this is, because I've heard this now a lot of like, well, crypto won't like break into the mainstream until it's regulated. And I'm going, okay, well, okay. So it's going to get regulated. Let's just like, the, it gets regulated. And then basically the SEC has control over it. So there's a bunch of controls about who can buy it and who can sell it. And all of a sudden the little casino game ends because now there are controls. And then doesn't like the demand just kind of like slip away because people are there because of the casino. Well, remember this is one part of crypto is crypto that where the founding team are inside of the United States, not all of crypto. And it's also for token issuers who want to issue a specific token. I think we are unfortunately running up against the end of our time. Uh, this was, at least for me and hopefully for others, wildly entertaining seeing you guys go. They're gonna continue in the back room. So thanks everyone, appreciate it. Thank you guys. It's Meredith Copet levian President and CEO of the New York Times, is one of my dear friends who I love deeply. Uh, she leads the company's global operations and directs its business strategy. She joined the Times nearly a decade ago to run advertising uh, and became CEO in 2020. Interviewing her, Chatting with her is Logan Bartlett, the managing director of Redpoint Ventures. Logan is also a host of Cartoon Avatars, a podcast covering the biggest stories in tech, but a side that nobody talks about. Let's give them a big round of applause, guys. Let's bring some energy for the end of the day. Thank you.
All right. Meredith, we have to, I think I counted Zach said fuck seven times, so we're gonna need to one up that. Uh, ah. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome, I'm happy to be here. You know so, what today is? No, what is today? Well, we Thursday? We figured this out, uh, team members here, we figured this out like half an hour ago on the way here. It's my two year anniversary of being CEO of The Times. Congratulations. Fun day to be here. And you've been at The Times for how long? Nine years wow. and counting. Yeah. So, so you are the CEO of the New York Times, which is distinct, I guess, as a disclosure from the editor of the New York Times. Maybe just to level set everyone, what the distinction between the two, what rolls into you functionally, how that sort of gets. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot more fun. Yeah, I believe it. Um, no, so um, it's, a, it's a good question. The first thing I always tell people is if you have something to say um, about the way you or your firm is covered in the Times, don't bother telling me. Because I've no going or do over it, so that that's well. Uh, you'll be giving your email out yeah, after. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the the executive editor of the Times, responsible for our journalism, his job is to make sure that we have a world class news report. My job is to make sure we have a successful business. We both actually report to the chairman and publisher of the Times. He's part of the the Ox Sulzberger family, and I'll just say that the structure. CEO not responsible for the, the content, not responsible for the coverage, is meant, it's been in place for a very long time, and it's meant to protect the independence of the journalism. So it's, you know, the idea is the journalism should be free from any influence, um, including our own commercial interest. And you know, it's it's the only the its purpose is is to pursue the truth. So my KPI is are we running a great and highly successful business? And do we have the right growth strategy? And are we building a larger and more profitable company as we go? And his KPI is, are we doing the best journalism in the world? If I get my KPI right, he's getting his KPI. Or and is, he's, he's able to do his more easily. And so the, the functional roles that will report into him are journalists, yeah. reporters? Basically the coverage. And coverage. that's about news coverage. Um, our news operation reports into him. Um, I, I'm responsible for all of our monetization, so all the commercial functions, our ad business, um, obviously our subscription business, marketing. I'm responsible for um, how people find and experience our journalism. So all things tech, data, digital product development. We have a giant yep. digital product development team. Um, I look after our standalone products. So I was saying to you just a few minutes ago, um, we, we've got a, a terrific um, portfolio of games and you may have heard we acquired a game called Wordle earlier this year. So that that's in, in my remit. Um, so Wordle is just one of the great games we have. Um, and I'm also responsible, we, we acquired a company called The Athletic, which is the second largest sports journalism subscription business um, in, in America. It's the largest, to my knowledge, without, without sports rights. I'm, I'm in charge of that. And basically the, the complex of products that sit around our, our news product. And then lastly, I'll just say, because I think for any company leader today, the, the, there are really interesting questions here. You know, I'm in charge of all the kind of how we show up and roll as a company. Um, so HR, finance, legal, comms, can't have enough comms people today. Yeah, totally. Um, so that's-, that's so, so, in term, so the New York Times gone through a big transformation from uh, offline to online and- Still have a newspaper. Still have a newspaper. Yes. Uh, heavier percentage ad-based to heavier percentage yeah. subscription-based. Um, you were there throughout this majority of the, how, how does actually a shift like that happen. Uh, it clearly was an existential risk if you didn't do it. So how do you go about tactically making something like that happen? Yeah, that's a, that's a fun question. And I should say, um, so I've been there nine years and I've spent like the vast majority of that time working on the, on the challenge of how do you go from being print-based, ad-heavy business with much of the profit coming you from- came up in ads as well. I, came, I came up in ads. Yep, um, and a, a shrinking print-based, ad-based business to, to a growing digital-based, subscription-based um, business. Um, it's been, been a lot of fun. Um, I'll, I'll say a couple things. 
Um, when I joined the company in 2013, we had sort of survived, like the, you, you asked about existential crisis. We had kind of made it through like the existential crisis, would the times be around if there, you know, if there was Google and, and other companies, but we were sort of running in place as a business. And as we looked ahead, you know, our print business was shrinking. We had a digital advertising business that was growing, but you know, in 2013, you were just beginning to see the big tech platforms emerge. And so the writing was kind of on the wall for those growth prospects. And we had, we had a digital subscription business that was kind of nascent and new at that point, but we weren't growing our digital business anywhere enough to make up for what we thought would be very steep print declines to, to come. Um, and so we really needed, you know, like you, there needs to be a galvanizing reason for transformation. And we just had this idea that we would not be able to do our journalism as ambitiously um, as we had done in, you know, in, in for at that point, 160 some odd years. And we, we didn't, we saw the writing on the wall that we'd shrink as a company. And so the, you asked, how did we do it? Yeah. You know, we got people together at, at the top of the company, news and business, um, you know, a, a small group of us, less than 10 um, in, you know, like 2015. And we said, what are the big calls we have to make about our future? And we made a handful of big calls that like still characterize the business today. The first one was very simply, what's our business? What are we, we doing here? And I always say the business strategy of the New York Times is five words. We make journalism worth paying for. And that was just like naming that, um, you know, that, that's a very simple idea. And in, in, you know, 2015, that was still worth paying for against a backdrop of a lot of free alternatives. But that meant like the resources go first and most to the journalism. So that was the first thing we said. Um, we said we're a subscription business first. In 20, you know, that seems kind of like a duh now. In 2015, that was a really big call. It meant like first, we do everything first at the company. Was that in contrast? Consumers. Is that digital an subscription? Ad uh, versus ads. Versus ads. And I'll say we have long had a pretty big and stable print subscription business. There are lots and lots of people, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people who pay a lot for the New York Times in print. But we saw the need to grow the company was to really scale digital subscriptions. And we said, that's the main idea of the company. And that means we don't make things for advertisers. We, we only do things for consumers because we believe this is like gonna be journalism worth paying for. And by the way, in the end, we made the bet that would mean a better ad business. And in fact, it, it has meant that. We also, I'll, I'll tell you one more. We said, you know, and this was controversial in 2015, we're a destination. We want to be a news site that, you know, people call by name, ask for by name, build a direct relationship with. At the time, most of the digitally native media companies were sort of, you know, writing and editing for Facebook and for, for, for the platforms. And we said, that's not our game. We need the platforms to help bring people to the platform. But ultimately, our best stuff should be on our own platform. So those are uh, unifying mission statements of what you believed. What point in the future did you pick to like actually march towards something? Obviously, you needed to actualize that. Like how, so, so that happens and you have these big, broad, visionary statements. Yeah. And you say, hey, in three years, we're going to get to X, Y, Z. Great question. I have two answers to that. At that moment in time, in 2015, we said the mile marker is we're gonna do these things and we're gonna double our digital revenue by 2020. So we, we said over the next, you know, it was like five and a half years, right? By the way, we got there more than a year early. Um, and it was so clear we were gonna get there early. We said, um, it, it, I think beginning of 2019, we set another mile marker. We said, we're gonna get to 10 million subscriptions, um, total subscriptions, mostly digital by 2025, we got there much earlier. Yep. So we, we've actually just sent another target. We said 15 million subscribers. It's harder to get a subscriber than a subscription because people buy multiple things from you by 2027. So basically five years, six years, that's, that's how we're kind of planning. But, but I want to make a, a slightly different point. Um, 
the Times has been around for 170 plus years. We really think in like decade and generational time horizons. And we have ambitions for, you know, what's the New York Times gonna be? How much bigger and more ambitious and more impactful can the journalism be? How much bigger business can we be over the next 10 years, 20 years? And one of the great things about the New York Times is we're a family controlled public company. That control structure allows us to be very focused on what's the value, cre the really big value creating thing to do for the long, long term. And I think that's why, the a big part of why the Times is where it is today versus a lot of the rest of, of um, digital media companies. What, what was the hardest part about that, like actually making this happen in practice? All this sounds obvious in hindsight, like seems like, okay, and at the time it clearly wasn't. People were building for Facebook or thought that ads were going to rule the world in perpetuity. So what was the hardest part about making it actually happen? Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple things. Um, we were really choiceful. You asked me, was it um, digital versus print? Yep. I said, actually, it was really subscription. It was that, but the more profound things thing was subscriptions over advertising. We made hard calls, and that meant we're not going to put time and resources or as, as much um, of our time and energy into those things. And to get, you know, thousands of people sort of marching in that direction, not everybody likes those calls, but ultimately the key to really changing something is to say, we've got a vision for this thing over a long time horizon, and we at the top of the house are gonna get aligned on the very tough calls to get there. I'll give you one more. Another thing that I think has helped the Times get to where it is, is the first dollar in the place goes to the journalism, period, hard stop. And that is in good times, and that's even in, in dark economic times. And, you know, that means there are moments when, you know, you want to be growing faster from, you know, uh, um, one perspective, but you say if you actually ensure that you're investing in your product the whole way through, you're ultimately creating more value over a longer time horizon. You touched on product there, and I think most people, New York Times is a media company, does journalism reporting, but you've, you've built as well, you have a lot of engineers working for you, a lot of product people, yeah. designers, all that. You've actually, product-led is uh, a big term now in technology in general, and I, I think there's a lot of stuff you guys do to be product-led, be it the soft, soft gating of paywalls yeah. and Wordle top of funnel and yep. um, podcasts and all that. How do you think about uh, what it is to be product-led and what the funnel of a, a New York Times uh, paying customer looks like? Yeah, I love this question because it's Thank like you. the zone that I've spent so much of the last um, half dozen years in. I, I joke inside that I like ran for office in my prior job at the Times as COO on a platform of product-driven growth. So it's like not a new idea at the Times. And, and here's why today, you know, something like 50 to 100 million people come to the New York Times every week. Nine million people, a little more than nine million people pay us for a subscription. So we, are, we already have this giant audience funnel right in front of us. And, you know, the idea is um, the vast majority of our growth comes by the experience someone has as, you know, often a non-paying customer, the experience they have when they hit a story page of the New York Times or when they get to the homepage or when they open an email um, from us. I would say, um, you know, we also put a lot of investment into brand at the New York Times and we, you know, spend real money in marketing and we, we've got a, a very sophisticated marketing team, but the vast majority of our growth comes from the way we sort of manage the free experience um, and the paid experience. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one, the Times has, you know, over the last like decade, um, the, I think the pay model now for the New York Times digital subscriptions are probably 11 or 12 years old. Now, um, even going back to when we launched, we've always had a pretty porous paywall, meaning you can get a lot of stuff 
for free. And that, had, that serves two purposes. One, it serves the mission purpose. We want a really wide audience for our journalism. We think that's really important. It's important to society. But two, it also means we're really building a funnel um, for where's, where is the next subscriber going to come from. So we are incredibly focused on both making sure there's enough value in the subscribe state so that you pay, but also so that we're constantly bringing new people into the times. So one way that you do that, I think, is through the daily, which has been, I, I don't know, number one, two. Through the daily? The daily yeah. podcast, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. As a, as a podcaster in good standing, you actually have to talk about other podcasts. Uh, and you so particularly have to talk about the daily. I, I, have, to, I have to do it, um, which has been an amazing success. It's been going it's on for how best. long? So it's probably six years old. Um, and was a personal project, I, I think you uh, took an interest I, I in wanna, it early I on. actually want to credit, um, we have an extraordinary um, team of people who, in, who, who are still um, working in our audio operation. Um, a, a guy named Sam Dolnick, who's a very senior editor, and a woman named Lisa Tobin, who's the original like mother and leader um, of The Daily, and Michael Barbaro, its host. They were there in inception. And they get all the credit for making something really extraordinary. There was actually a really fun anecdote um, at the Times that when, when they brought one of them, I don't know which, brought like an early cut of the daily to somebody on the leadership team, that person said, but wait, it's only one story. We're the New York Times. We, like, we have to tell multiple stories. And it was this like great manifestation of like the what you do in the next medium has to be of your quality and it has to be of what you have brand permission to do, but it's also gonna be very, very different from what you did in your last medium. And the daily, unlike the newspaper, is one big story a day. So, um, so it was started six years ago. What's remarkable about it is a couple million people um, probably listen to the daily, something in that range every single day. More people listen to the daily every day still six years in than ever read the weekday newspaper, um, huge audience. It's also brought a really different audience to the time, the demographic of who listens to the Daily is younger, it's more female, um, just been a huge success. And one of the things that it's done that I don't think gets enough attention is it's explained um, to many um, times listeners how a story comes to be so, you know, a lot of times we'll publish a big story and the next day, the reporters on that story or the editor will be on the daily kind of telling you um, how did this happen? I mean, the, the kind of shiny example is Jody Cantor and Megan Tuhi on the daily just after the Harvey Weinstein story and investigation broke. Um, and they were able to tell how they actually got to this story that was part of a body of work that like literally changed the world. So the daily gives people a chance to not just know the story, but to know how did this story come to be? What went into it? And I actually think that's done a lot for journalism to remind people what goes into independent journalism. And so it's been an amazing success. I think it's top, I don't know, I always see it top one, two, three, four, five uh, on the podcast list I look at. Consistently. Consistently. I'm really proud of. Consistently. Yeah. What, um, I, I don't know what the next podcast is for the New York, Ezra Klein maybe has the Ezra next. Ezra Klein show, everyone should listen. Yeah. But Incredible. He, he came over to the New York Times. Came to the Times. So I, I don't know what the next homegrown podcast is, but breaking through, as I've seen myself, breaking through in the podcast ecosystem hard. is hard. What do you think? The Daily caught lightning in the bottle with, and what do you think uh, other podcasts uh, maybe haven't had the same level of breakthrough noise? Because you guys have invested quite a bit in podcasts. What do you think makes it a uniquely difficult platform that The Daily did well and that you're trying to recapture? That's a great question. Uh, I'll say a couple of things. One, the amount of kind of time and energy and resource that goes into The Daily is staggering. So like every bit of it, you know, the number of, um, of producers who work on it, the people making, you know, the people making the sound in the can background. You, can you say the, the, how many people? It's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, but, but by the way, it's worth it. It's a wild success from a consumer standpoint. It is very, um, it is a very successful advertising vehicle. 
So, so one of the things, and I, I just feel like this doesn't get talked about enough, it is a highly produced endeavor. Um, and, and like the care and the creative energy that goes into making the New York Times goes into the daily. And so that, that's a piece of it. The other piece of it that I feel like people don't talk about that makes the daily magical is it's got a newsroom of a couple thousand people at the New York Times making journalism for its topics. So, you know, something extraordinary happens in the world and that night they've got, you know, often like the reporters who are at the scene and in, you know, in the widest way with the most resources there to tell you about it. And the incredible example of that, we named, um, we named a second host um, of The Daily this year, and she happens to be, um, she speaks Russian. And when Russia invaded Ukraine, we actually, you know, they, they um, ran The Daily from Ukraine. And there are these incredible episodes where she is like literally reporting on the daily. So it's really the thing that makes it so magical is it's got the whole of, of the New York Times. They get to time. cherry pick uh, yeah. the, the best of it. Yeah, but, and I, I'll just say, because it's like, it is magical. The Ezra Klein show is really, really good. And I'll also say, like, you talk to Ezra, the kind of level of care and research and kind of background work. One of the things that differentiates a New York Times story from, you know, other stories potentially on the same topic is the level of care and attention and resources that go into it. And I think Ezra would say, I, I suspect he would say the level of care and kind of creative energy that's gone into his show is awesome. That's great. Um, you mentioned brand and investing yeah. a lot in brand. Uh, the New York Times obviously has an iconic brand and we're living in, uh, I would say, polarized times in the media at large. And I realize you're not responsible for editorial and all of that. I, I could argue that some level of the polarization actually uh, is, is good for business, right? Uh, and there's elements of, of some, um, are you actually a, uh, a liberal in good standing if you're not subscribed to the New York Times, right? Or you don't listen to the Daily or all of that. How, what do you think just at New York Times brand level and, and everything that's going on in the media uh, world today, like you have to manage this. You're not obviously weighing in on the reporters, but it impacts the business side of it. It's been an interesting two years. It's been an interesting, did you say nine since you've been there? What, what, They've all been interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know that. For one reason or another. Yeah. Any, any just, uh, I'll leave it open-ended, but just any thoughts? Yeah. Or I feel like I, I have to ask that question. Yeah. Um, I can't tell if you're like poking at a premise. Is polarization good for business? I, I want to be- Not really, poking, explicit. I, I will ask that. Yeah. Is, is it good for business? Uh, and, and, uh, and I guess, how do you think, how do you view all this? I want to be really clear about two things. One, we are doing independent journalism that, as I said earlier, is, you know, its objective is to help people seek the truth and with curio curiosity and open-mindedness understand the world. That is the work of the times, one. So we are not writing for any one group or another. We are, this is about the pursuit of truth. And the other thing I wanna say is, um, and this is where the mission and the business, there's like no daylight for it to work. You know, really high quality general interest news should have a really wide audience. And we are incredibly focused on the relevance of our journalism to a very large group of people. Um, you know, anecdotally, I'll say I was, I, I, I can't remember if I was chief revenue officer or chief operating officer, but I was in charge of subscriptions just after Trump was elected. And there was this like huge surge, you know, in late 2016. And then, of course, you know, that comes down off a peak like a year later and everybody was like, oh, they're never going to sell more subscriptions. And of course we did. We, we kept growing. And then Biden was elected and everybody said, oh, they're never going to sell more subscriptions. And of course we did. We actually had a better year. We sold more subscriptions, net subscriptions in 2021 than we had in 2019. Um, so, you know, like we live in a really complex world. 
we want to be seeking the truth and helping a much wider group of people get to understanding um, in that world. And we, we think our products are going to be increasingly valuable to, to a wide group. I'm going to say one more thing on your polarized point. At the peak of COVID, one in two adult Americans were coming to the New York Times. So, you know, like that is not journalism for, for like a group of people. And, and, you know, some number of months ago, just our COVID case tracking database crossed a billion views. Oh. So it's like, you know, this is journalism for a really wide audience. It's, so obviously the, the structure of the times allows uh, the, the governing body to sort of pick a time decades in the future, right? Uh, and then there's, there's zooming that all the way into what, what does someone do tomorrow? Yeah. As you think about these like ebbs and flows of it, what point do you pick to manage against? It sounds like 2026, you set some goals or 2027, you reset goals around. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me just comment on what we're doing now. So I told you, we said we doubled div digital revenue. We got there faster. And then we said 10 million subscriptions. We got there faster. The new target is 15 million subscribers by, by year end. 2027 and to build a larger and more profitable company as we go. Um, and how do we do that? We, our vision is we want to be the essential subscription for everyone in the English speaking world who wants to engage deeply with the world and understand it. And that means doing three things really, really well. Be the world's best news destination. I think we've got a running start at that, but still plenty more to do. Two, help people engage more deeply with their lives and their passions with leading lifestyle products. You know, we've got an unbelievable recipe app. We have a really cool portfolio of games and a crazy successful game in Wordle that's just pointing attention to all these other awesome games we have. We just bought The Athletic. We intend to go really big in sports and, and we've got a great shopping advice site. So lead in news, build leadership in these other spaces and then put those two things together in a way that makes the New York Times, in all of its kind of breadth, indispensable to the daily lives of tens of millions more people. That is the game we're playing. And by the way, that is, you know, the better we do at that, the more highly ambitious journalism that holds power to account we can do and the larger and more profitable company we build. That's great. Uh, well, we're coming up on time. Can I give you some quick hitters real fast? Just yeah. You... Substack. Uh-huh. <laughs> quick hit response. Immediate thing that comes to mind. More journalism for more people is always a good thing. Twitter. <sighs> um, we are really focused on Twitter has a place. We are incredible incredibly focused on making sure um, we don't overuse Twitter to hear one particular audience or another. Fake news. I hate that expression. And I think it's done such a disservice to the public's understanding of the value and the resources that go into real, you know, quality, original, independent journalism. New York City. Awesome. So happy to be here. <laughs> Donald Trump. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Meredith Kofi Levian. Give me they, one more. Yeah. Return, wait, wait, wait. Return to the office. So I've been CEO for two years today with, without the full New York Times kind of in a hybrid way with many people coming to an office many days. And I am really excited next week we begin our official hybrid, you know, majority of people there. Um, you know, a couple or a few days a week. And I am so excited about that. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Alexa. So that'll do it for the 35th episode of Cartoon Avatars. Thank you to Meredith copet Levian for coming on and talking about the, uh, the business of the New York Times. Uh, thank you to David Hoffman for the uh, thankless job of, of debating Zach Weinberg on, on crypto. Um, and thank you to the uh, Inspired Capital as well as Primary Ventures team for, uh, for, for providing us that audio and video and the opportunity to do, do all of that. Uh, Appreciate everyone listening in and look forward to seeing people next week on the 36th episode of Cartoon Avatars. Cartoon Avatars.